Okay, folks. It's a very, very, very different Sunday, isn't it? <laughs> I don't even know what to do here. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm allowed to take my mask off at the front here while I'm this far away from you because they have said that in churches, in religious services and ceremonies such as weddings, if you're up on the stage, you're allowed to remove your mask. So I hope everybody is comfortable with that. What I am worried about is that when the minister gets up here, he is going to be like walking around and if he starts to get close to you, I felt like I should have brought you all squirt guns today so you could just <laughs> squirt at him and make him step back. But you can, you can just hold your hand up and that'll remind him because <laughs> he is a bit of a wanderer, isn't he? Anyway, uh, we are so glad to see you. It has been six months to the day. Isn't that amazing? <sighs> it, is, it has been very hard for some people. It has been pretty easy for some, some people. And it has been really different for all of us. So I'm very, very glad to see you today. We're going to start with um, this morning with Rick, what Rick has to say here. This is his board. He's going to be talking about the book of Ezra this morning. It's about the Jews rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem after coming home from Babylonian captivity. And it's a story of return, restoration, and rededication. So it's kind of a fitting thing after our six months in exile, isn't it? That we return and we celebrate who we are, what we have, and where we're going. And we are going to be mindful this morning of the rebuilding blocks that threaten our progress. We are going to be touching on the restoration of the Jewish temple. And there's great lessons for all of us when we look at one particular group in there. And that was the elders. The elders came back to the rebuilt temp temple and they wept and they weren't crying out of joy because they were home again and seeing the temple rebuilt. They were crying because they had memories of how beautiful it was before. And I want to say that's, uh, that's kind of a, a sad thing to focus on how something was instead of focusing on what we have. And so this morning, you know, we know we can't stand in little groups and we can't hug and we can't sing out the way we aren't normally do. But if we focus on those deficiencies instead of the fact that we are together again and we can rejoice and we are fed and we are clothed and we have a savior, a God who loves us and we worship him together, then that would be just sad. This morning should be about a time of joy. And I hope that we can do that because the church is the family of God and that's us this morning. So we're going to start with a song about restoration and let's worship our God as we go through the days of Elijah.
God is the only one that can do so many things when it comes to restoring our life. I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures of fame Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together
we don't want to have too many people at the microphone. So we are still relying on some technology here. And this morning, Jean, who's not with us this morning, is going to be able to do our reading for us. And so we're going to turn this right up. You are God's building. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done on the cross for us. So now you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Our next song is a little bit of social distancing from Shane and Shane, if you like them. And this song has a bit of clapping that we can get involved with as well. Absolutely. I think one of the good things about the strange period we've just come through is that we get to think about things maybe a little bit more and plan things a little bit more. So we're going to listen now and join Jane in prayer as she lifts our requests before God. 
Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, your Son, who you gave freely to come to this earth as God-man, to walk on this earth, to face the temptations that we face, so that we are able to say that we can be overcomers. Your Son, who ministered to those around us, giving us an example to reach out to others. Your Son, who died on the cross, the one who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastised for our peace, and through the stripes he took on his body so that we can be healed. Most importantly, you raised him from the dead, and we serve a risen Savior today. You have seated him on your right hand as advocate And as he makes intercession for us, we can also join with him as heirs and joint heirs. We can come to your throne today boldly in Jesus' authority and ask these things of you. Father, we pray for life to flow through this world. Your life, your resurrection power, your saving power that brings true life. We choose life connected and in union with Jesus' life in us. Father, we pray for goodness to come overcome the wickedness and evil in this world. Your goodness demonstrated through your people and the mighty hand of God intervening to show forth your glory. Father, we pray for light to shine through the darkness of this world. You are the light of the world. God, burst your light into the dark places of this world. We pray the Lord of the harvest to thrust laborers into the fields that are ripe unto harvest. God, we ask for the salvation of billions of people in the next short time, that there is a mighty harvest in these days. Send forth your Spirit to prepare the hearts of billions to hear and receive the message of Jesus. Lord, we ask for the souls of the lost. We plead for the souls who have not yet heard, that have not had opportunity to hear the truth of the gospel. Lord, make ways in the desert to bring the gospel of peace. Flow powerful rivers of living water in the deserts of human culture and religion. Send refreshing words of the Spirit to blow in the spirits of humanity. Awaken the spirits of humanity to a recognition of their emptiness without you. Show them yourself. We plead for your visitation to those in this world who are bound in religion, bound in culture, bound in poverty, bound in slavery, bound in riches, bound in greed and selfishness. Father, we ask for you to release those who are bound by the powers of darkness, of the principalities, of workers of evil and iniquity. I ask you to release those who are bound by foul and evil spirits, those who only know the evil and dark side of life, which leads to death. I plead for those that are bound by Satan himself and his lies, distortions, falsehoods, his violence and destruction. We can say today that they are released in Jesus' name and in his authority. God, show yourself forth in power. Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God, and we can rejoice today because you are Emmanuel. Our God is with us. And if God is with us, who can stand against us? Our God is with us. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we are going to share communion. And again, it's going to be a little bit different. I did want to say, though, communion just isn't the same when we're all in different places, or even when we're watching the same thing but at different times. There's something about being together that's very important. 
I spoke with a friend recently who said she prays daily and believes in God, but she doesn't want anything to do with that organized religion. We know churches and Christians have always let people down. And they always will. Because churches are filled with stumbling human sinners. So why is it that God wants us to be part of this thing? Well, I know lots of you already know several answers for encouraging each other, for help, for learning more, etc. But listen again to what Paul said about the church in Ephesus. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So to me that means that apart we're just single stones. But together we build a temple of praise for our God. A place of joy and safety and responsibility and salvation and forgiveness because God knows we shouldn't be alone. Together we help form the way to him.
it's a great song to keep in our minds this week. He is the one who makes a way. And we sometimes sing that old song, God will make a way. God does. It's not always the way that we want, the way that we have predicted, the one that we have you know, been sure is the right thing. Instead, God makes the best way. We've had wildfires, hurricanes, riots and looting, uh, a full pandemic. But the funny thing is that we are still people who are richly blessed. I think of giving as a time in our worship where we get a chance to reflect on what God has blessed us with because it is a lot. So we're just going to have our blessing now because I wanted to share that with you. It's time to change your ways. This is the restoration part, isn't it? It's time to change your ways, turn to face God so he can wipe away your sins, pour out showers of blessing to refresh you, and send you the Messiah he prepared for you, namely Jesus. Wow, that's pretty cool, isn't it? But make sure you see the order that needs to be followed. First, God needs to restore you here to sinlessness, and then he can pour out the showers of blessing to you and send you the Messiah. Almost exactly six months after our last in-person meeting in mid-March, we're finally able to get everyone together in this wonderful family reunion. And we're grateful for that because it's been a long half year. When I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I was reminded of another more dramatic homecoming from about 500 BC. It involves the Jews returning to their homeland after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. They had been through a lot. There was more turmoil to come. But that shining moment was a wonderful time of return, renewal, and rededication. It's the perfect example for us. But first, some background, starting with the Babylonians of ancient Iraq and their ambitious leader, Nebuchadnezzar. Toward the end of the 7th century BCE, the Babylonian Empire quickly conquers the lands to the west of the Euphrates River, including the Kingdom of Judah. When King Jehoiakim of Judah tries to rebel against Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar quashes the rebellion and exiles the rulers and generals. Just 10 years later, Jehoiakim's brother Zedekiah, the new king of Judah, rebels again against the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar is furious. He decides to teach Judah a lesson it will never forget. This tower, known as the Israelite Tower, was uncovered by Professor Nachman Avigad in 1970. From the top of the tower, Zedekiah's soldiers watched in fear as hundreds of thousands of Babylonian archers, horsemen, and infantrymen stood before the walls. From here, they saw the Babylonian Engineering Corps close in on the city and lay siege to it. Right here, near the tower adjacent to the city gate, a fierce battle takes place. Babylonian archers shoot thousands of arrows at the Israelite defenders, providing cover for the Babylonian infantry as they charge the city gate. The Israelite defenders fire back with all their might. Beneath the layer of ash here, Professor Nachman Avigad uncovered arrowheads shot by Babylonian archers, right next to Israelite arrowheads shot by Zedekiah's soldiers in their desperate attempt to repel the enemy. Despite their efforts, the Israelite soldiers, hungry and exhausted, cannot stop the powerful, organized troops spread out before them. On the 9th of Tammuz, 586 BCE, after more than a year and a half under siege, the northern wall is breached and the Babylonian army bursts into the city. The Babylonian soldiers slaughter the people of the city and wreak destruction everywhere. The cries of pain of the victims, many of them women, children, and the elderly, are heard from every corner. 
And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, the nineteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, every great man's house, he burned with fire. Here in the royal compound in the city of David, among buildings that collapsed in the horrific fire, archaeologist Igal Shiloh uncovers a thick layer of black ash. It turns out to be the destruction layer of Jerusalem. The diggers' faces are black with the soot and dirt that covered the ruins from the burnt buildings. Excitedly, the excavators unearthed 2,600-year-old buildings, one after another. They also discovered eating utensils, furniture, and seals, all buried under the ash of the Great Fire. In the sweltering summer of 586 BCE, all of Jerusalem is set ablaze. On the 9th of Av, the temple, the symbol of the spiritual covenant between the Israelites and their God, goes up in flames. From that terrible day until now, the 9th of Av has been a day of intense mourning for the entire Jewish people. Nebuchadnezzar finishes off the destruction with an act that will ensure that Jerusalem will never rebel again. He raises the city walls to their foundations. Now, their heads bowed, the exiles march to Babylon, carrying musical instruments among their meager possessions. But the melody that played in Jerusalem through countless turbulent days is now silenced. In its place arise the hushed tones of the exiles' lament. For two generations, the people of God languished. Then the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, or ancient Iranians. And their king, Cyrus, gave permission to a Jewish leader named Zerubbabel to go back to Jerusalem in 538 BC and rebuild the city. God stirred the hearts of the priests and leaders of the tribes to rebuild the Temple of the Lord, the Bible says, and all their neighbors helped by giving them articles of silver and gold, supplies, and livestock. King Cyrus himself returned the articles Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Lord's temple and gave them to the leader of the exiles returning to Judah. The big priority was to rebuild the temple because it was the symbol of God's presence among his people. King David's son Solomon had built the original, much more elaborate temple on the site where Abraham almost sacrificed his son Isaac before God stopped him. Today, Islam's golden Dome of the Rock stands on that same site. And now, there's a completely different kind of temple. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done on the cross for us. You are members of God's family. Together, we are His house. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus Himself. We are carefully joined together in Him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord, where God lives by His Spirit. Yes, the Church is the temple of God, the visible symbol of His presence among His people today. And we in this congregation are just a small part of that temple. But like the one of old, we need to recognize that there will be times of growth and expansion, and other times when it's necessary to rebuild. This is one of those rebuilding times. Though we're back from coronavirus exile after six months, we recognize we may have another round of social distancing because of a likely second wave. So we're going to enjoy this while we can. But this is a good time to think about the future. So may God stir our hearts as we think about rebuilding His holy place and learning from those who went before us. As rebuilding began, the prophets Zechariah and Haggai were writing and preaching, encouraging Zerubbabel and his high priest Joshua. Some of the family leaders made voluntary offerings toward the rebuilding of God's temple, we're told, and each leader gave as much as he could. The total of their gifts came to 61,000 gold coins, 6,250 pounds of silver, and 100 robes for the priests. So the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and some of the common people settled in villages near Jerusalem. The rest returned to their own towns throughout Israel. So the first thing that happens here is giving, beginning with the leaders, because that's what good leaders do. They go first and set an example, whether it's money, time, or effort. And the gifts were all voluntary, while the people were encouraged by the prophets who read the Word of God. 
but it didn't end with the leaders. The people too opened their hearts and their treasures. And you can bet that some of those people didn't have a lot of money, but everyone found something to contribute. And so it is with us. In a group this small, we need everyone doing something. So if you don't have a lot of money, nobody's gonna care about that. But we all need to be active in the service of God, remembering that we're doing this not primarily for ourselves, not even for others, but for God. According to the Bible, the returning Jews assembled with a unified purpose. Even though they were afraid of the local residents, they rebuilt the altar at its old site. Then they began to sacrifice each morning and evening. Next, they celebrated the Feast of Shelters, which commemorates the time they spent living in temporary shelters in the desert, protected by God. It was a reminder God would protect them too. Worship was at the very heart of everything the exiles did. If nothing else, coronavirus has taught us the value not just of worship, but of worshiping together. And part of that is being grateful and recognizing that we too are absolutely reliant on God. As for the workforce, the book of Ezra says it was made up of everyone who had returned from exile, including Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest, his fellow priests, and all the Levites. Finally, the foundation was laid. With praise and thanks, they sang this song to the Lord, he is so good, his faithful love endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. When it came to the work of rebuilding, nobody was exempt, including the spiritual leaders. So too today, no job is too big or too small or beneath any of us. We are all in this together. In the eyes of God, we're equal, and we don't serve to be seen or recognized. We serve because God is good, and His love really does endure forever. But among the exiles, discouragement soon set in, long before the temple was complete. The foundation was laid, but many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who'd seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. That's because Solomon's original temple had been a masterpiece of art and architecture, lavish and opulent. The new one was a mere shadow of the first, so there was a renewed sense of loss and a hankering for the good old days. But the others were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. In the same way, we've had some losses, and there may be more, and we need to be open and honest about that. But we can't be so fixed on the past that we're blind and oblivious to the many, many blessings God still affords all of us. Besides, nostalgia just isn't what it used to be. And not only that, our job is to renew and to reconnect and to re-engage. And it may well be that we will never reach the height we once had, but that's not the point. If we are serious about our faith, if we recommit, God will honor us as we try to rebuild a temple of praise and service. Besides, the past is a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. Back in Ezra, there's not only joy and sorrow, but anger too, from the Samaritans. The Samaritans were Jews left behind by the Babylonians who then intermarried with the nations around them. Purebred Jews considered them inferior half-breeds and planted the seeds of racism that were still alive and well in the time of Jesus. Let us build with you, for we worship your God just as you do, the Samaritans said, but the Jews refused. So the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them and to frustrate their plans. They also wrote to the new king of Persia, Darius, trying to stir up trouble but that led to only a short delay. I find it really interesting that in the record, there is absolutely no indication the Jewish leaders went to God and asked if the Samaritans should be included. Instead, they just say no. Knowing Jesus the way we do and seeing how he treated Samaritans, do we think for a minute that he would have excluded them? I think not. And yet, that's exactly what the church has done over the centuries. We have divided over race and culture and creed. But today, 
At a time when people desperately need to know who God is and what his love can do, we need to understand we don't have a monopoly on truth and righteousness, that we can work together with other Christians even when we don't condone everything they think, believe, or do. Because excluding other people, all that does is build anger, resentment, and bitterness. Still, the temple was finally finished on March 12th in 516 BC, more than 20 years after the return from captivity. It was dedicated with great joy by the people of Israel after the people had purified themselves. Hundreds of animals were sacrificed and offerings were made for the sins of the people. Then on April 21st, the return to exile celebrated Passover, which commemorates God's deliverance of his people from their Egyptian slavery. And there was great joy throughout the land because the Lord had caused the king to help them to rebuild the temple of God. The equivalent for us, of course, is communion. It celebrates the forgiveness of our sins, our oneness with God and each other, and our deliverance from sin and death. But unlike the first and second temples, this temple is not fully rebuilt. There is much to do in our hearts, our lives, and our church. So here's another powerful parallel from our template. At one point, a scribe named Ezra arrives from Babylon. We're told Ezra had determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. He gathered the people together and called them to a higher standard of purity, saying they'd taken on too many of the characteristics of the unbelievers around them. He even took the radical step of calling on the men to divorce their pagan wives, something the prophet Micah seems to abhor. But renewal swept the land. Then a third leader arrived. His name was Nehemiah, and he focused on rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem for protection. So the second temple lasted for centuries. In the beginning, it may have been nothing compared to Solomon's original, but 20 years before the birth of Jesus, the Jewish king called Herod the Great completely remodeled the temple, adding magnificent new buildings and facades, and restoring much of its grandeur. Some of the work was still underway during the ministry of Jesus. Then, much as the Babylonians destroyed the first temple, the Romans destroyed the second, and all of Jerusalem, in 70 AD, in retaliation for an ongoing revolt. The city was breached and set ablaze, including the temple. All that remains now from that day is the western wall and some other ruins. Altogether, the second temple lasted 585 years. And by the way, many Jews today believe a third temple will be rebuilt on the same site as the first two. But we believe the church is the final temple, because when God finally wraps everything up at the end of days, we won't need a physical reminder of his presence. He will be with us, and we will be with him. Meantime, we're called to a higher standard of purity, so we can't get enmeshed in the values, attitudes, and behaviors of the people around us. Instead, let's embrace this time of rebuilding, recommit to putting God and others first, and do everything within our power to make this church an honor to God and a reflection of Christ. You know what's at the heart of rebuild. You and I. Have a wonderful week.